Welcome back. So in the last video, we talked all about partial differential equations, what they are, what they do, and we gave a number of canonical PDEs that we can use uh, to understand kind of physical phenomena like how traveling waves travel, how heat diffuses, uh, steady state heat distributions, things like that. And today I'm going to zoom in on Laplace's equation, which is one of my absolute favorite and one of the most uh, useful equations in all of physics, okay? From gravitation to fluid flow, electrostatics, uh, thermal dynamics, it's super useful almost everywhere. And actually Laplace's equation is uh, one of those cases where uh, it's really, really useful for motivating things like the Fourier transform. So that's uh, a very, very useful uh, perspective. Now, before I jump in, I want to give a quick recap of what we talked about in partial differential equations. And I hope you can tell how much I love PDEs because they give us a language of writing down what we observe in the world. So the world around us is changing, and it's changing in time and in space. So if you look at uh, the elastic waves on the Earth during an earthquake, if you look at uh, galaxies colliding, if you look at uh, you know, the waves crashing on the beach, these are uh, systems where the state of the system, the function, the state of the system U is changing in space and in time. And these partial differential equations allow us to codify or encode physics that we know about the system into an equation that we can analyze and solve uh, to use this to predict uh, what will happen in the future, what will happen for other parameters. And so, um, the PDE is usually written in terms of some function u, which we think of as the state of the system. Uh, this could be the temperature in a plate as a function of, of space and time, in which case I would have the heat equation as the PDE that describes the governing physics. Uh, and so that function u is normally what we're trying to solve for. So we have a, a partial differential equation that we write down from physics or we derive from physics and we're trying to solve for u as a function of x and t so we know what the state of our system will be, for example, at a future time uh, or at a different place in space. Now, what I didn't mention is that to actually solve these things, you absolutely need initial conditions. You need to know what the initial state of your system is at time zero, and you need to know what boundary conditions you have. Uh, you need to know kind of what is happening on the boundaries. If I have a, a plate of metal and I want to know its temperature distribution, I need to know what are the temperatures at the edges. Are they insulated? Are, is one edge in a cold bath and the other edge is in a hot bath? Uh, those are important for the solution. But the goal here is to solve for this function that I care about, whether it's a temperature distribution. This u could be a, a vector of functions, u1, u2, u3, for the velocity field of a fluid, which is another thing I'm often interested in solving for. And we solve these PDEs for those variables. Now, these partial differential equations, uh, we're going to see this in Laplace's equation. We already actually have seen this. These encode things I want my solution to uh, satisfy. So for example, in many systems I know that I have conservation of mass, uh, conservation of momentum, linear and angular, and conservation of energy. And so for example, in a fluid flow, I can write down the conservation of momentum, and I can using like Gauss's theorem or Stokes's theorem, using my vector calculus identities, I can derive a partial differential equation that has to be satisfied uh, for momentum to be conserved in that, uh, in that physics. And in that case, you actually derive the Navier-Stokes equations. Those are the partial differential equations for, mass conser for, for momentum conservation in a fluid. Uh, and similarly, the heat equation is the conservation of thermal energy, um, and, and the list goes on and on. Your conservation laws result in partial differential equations that you can then solve for a solution. So just fantastically cool, um, you know, almost all of the physics that have been characterized over the last few hundred years has resulted in a partial differential equation, uh, which we think of as the governing equation, the law of nature for that particular conservation law, uh, mass, momentum, energy, and so on and so forth. Today we're going to talk about Laplace's equation, um, and Laplace's equation we're going to write it down as the Laplace operator of some function phi equals zero. Again, this function phi is the, the state function I care about. We, sometimes we call it a potential function or a harmonic function if it satisfies Laplace's equation, so this harmonic function. Uh, and we've already shown that these phi's can be very, very useful 
for getting gradient flow fields, vector fields, which are the gradient of phi, that are irrotational and incompressible, so potential flows. And in fact, I'm actually just going to write this out. So uh, this solution phi here essentially gives you a potential that you can use to make a gradient field. So this is um, an incompressible uh, gradient field, uh, gradient field phi. And the way I think about that, this Laplacian operator is actually, you know, del squared of phi is equal to the divergence of the gradient of the scalar function phi. So essentially, gradient fields are always irrotational. They always have curl zero. That's a vector identity you can check out yourself. So the curl of any gradient field is always zero. It's always irrotational. But if we also specify that we want this gradient flow to be incompressible, so its divergence equals zero, that's the same thing as saying that the Laplacian of that potential phi has to be zero. So Laplace's equation essentially gives us these incompressible gradient flow fields, uh, grad phi. Okay, we already saw this in potential flow. What I want to do today is write down a number of the physical systems where Laplace's equation comes up. Okay, so uh, I'll just do that right now. So the first example is going to be uh, gravitation. So this kind of uh, gravitational potential. And this is really important. I, wanna, I can't emphasize this enough. When I talk about gravitation and electrostatics, I am talking about the, the field or the vector field away from point masses and point charges. So for example, if I am uh, free falling towards Earth, I can use this gravitational potential. But the minute I hit a point mass, you know, things are a little bit different. So, so we assume that we're kind of in a free space away from actual masses. We're in the solar system moving around, and we think of Jupiter and the Sun and the Earth and the Moon, you know, all the planets as point masses. And away from those point masses, uh, the gravitational potential satisfies Laplace's equation. Okay, good. Um, so this is away uh, from mass. Those masses are kind of like singularities uh, in this potential. And so um, how do I want to draw this? I'll just actually draw like a little, you know, Earth with all of its uh, gravitational potential fields. And we know that the potential, um, you know, is a function of the, the distance away from the Earth. So it has this kind of uh, spherical symmetry. And we know that our potential um, F so our vector field, our force field, you know, Newton's uh, law of gravitation, our force field is minus gradient of this vector potential where V equals uh, minus M of the little point. Let's say I'm a little point out here with little m. The planet has big M um, gravitational constant divided by my radius to that mass, okay? This is my, my potential function V uh, it's a function of three variables, x, y, and z, or r, theta, and phi, whatever coordinates you want. This is a three-dimensional potential, but it's a scalar potential of, of these three spatial coordinates. And it establishes a vector field that satisfies Laplace's equation away from point masses. So you can essentially verify, so verify that Laplacian of v equals zero away from point masses. Good. Okay, gravitation, that's one really, really good example. Uh, and similarly, we know that electrostatics kind of Coulomb's law is almost identical to Newton's law. So of course, this is also gonna be true for uh, electrostatics, um, electrostatic and electrostatic potential. Um, so if you open up, you know, kind of uh, Jackson's ENM or Griffith's ENM, you're going to be looking a lot at the uh, Laplace's equation for these electrostatic potentials. You're going to learn techniques to find, you know, a basis of solutions that you can add up to, to kind of get more complicated uh, electrostatic potentials if there's lots of different point masses or distributions of, sorry, point charges and distributions of point charges, um, things like that. And so similarly, you know, if I draw this in blue, we have uh, kind of these, uh, every charge, and again, away from any charge, my field is going to satisfy Laplace's equation. 
So this is fundamentally similar, kind of Coulomb's law um, is very similar to gravitation. And I'm, I'm not going to go any farther than that. It's basically gravitation, but with, you know, now these masses, they're, you know, opposites attract, same signs repel, so it's, a, you know, just a sign difference. Okay, two really, really, really important, like whole textbooks, big, big textbooks on, you know, electrostatics, on gravitation, all governed by uh, Laplace's equation away from a, a point charge or point mass. Another area, probably my favorite, where I learned about Laplace's equation and really where I learned about partial differential equations, in fact, where modern PDEs, a lot of them came from, uh, if you ask my opinion, is heat conduction. So this is another one of the main applications of Laplace's equation, heat conduction. Uh, heat conduction, and specifically I mean steady state heat conduction. Steady state uh, heat conduction. And so in steady state heat conduction, what we're going to do is we are going to say that we have a temperature T. T equals the temperature. And this is T is the temperature in some object. This could be a thin metal rod, like a wire, a power cable. It could be the temperature in a 2D plate of metal. It could be the temperature distribution on the, the nose cone of a, you know, satellite or, or rocket or, uh, you know, a vehicle re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. It could be the temperature distribution of some object we care about. And uh, specifically, so we know that the heat equation, I'm just going to write this down. We have partial T partial, uh, partial little t, the derivative of temperature with respect to time is equal to a positive constant alpha squared times the Laplacian operator of my temperature. Uh, and I'm going to derive this. In one of these lectures, we're actually going to derive this from conservation of thermal energy. Again, conservation laws are how we get PDEs using vector calculus, using Gauss's theorem, essentially, and vector calculus. We will derive this, so just take it for granted. Uh, and in steady state, steady state meaning that when, when, when the temperature distribution stops changing, we have that uh, Laplacian of T has to equal zero in steady state. So if I have, you know, some uh, thin metal rod and it's insulated on the ends and I hit it with a blowtorch in the middle so I give it some, you know, some forcing, the steady state temperature distribution will satisfy Laplace's equation. This is super, super useful. Um, if I don't have the blowtorch solution, this will approach a constant, uh, a constant solution. Uh, and then the fourth example that we talked about, and we've already seen a lot of this, is uh, incompressible irrotational flows. Incompressible irrotational flows. Uh, these are so-called potential pot, potential flows, uh, where I have a vector field that equals the gradient of phi, where phi satisfies Laplace's equation. So this is a very useful category of fluid flows that we use uh, you know, to design aircraft and, and things like that. Okay, so even just one of these simple canonical PDEs have all of these different major applications in physics. And so it really should motivate us to try to understand how to solve Laplace's equation and how to build up that mathematical architecture uh, to, to look at the solutions of this. And again, like I mentioned before, because this is a linear partial differential equation, uh, meaning that these derivatives act as linear operators on phi, it means that linear superposition holds. So if I have two solutions of this, phi1 and phi2, or two temperature distributions, t1 and t2, and I add those up, that will also be a solution of Laplace's equation. Okay, so two solutions add up, they're still a solution. And so what that allows us to do is try to find kind of a basis of eigensolutions, like this infinite family of orthogonal solutions, so that I can add them up in different combinations to get particular solutions for a particular boundary condition and initial condition, things like that. And this will actually be a lot like what we do in ordinary differential equations, where we diagonalize uh, our, our linear ODE into eigenvector coordinates. We can diagonalize this equation into eigenfunction coordinates. 
And it turns out that the eigenfunctions are going to be our Fourier sine and cosine functions. So that's how Fourier derived his Fourier transform, was essentially to diagonalize this heat equation. Okay? And so this is a really, really, really important set of concepts. And this is the building block to almost all of modern quantitative uh, physics where things depend on space and on time. Okay, last thing I want to show you is uh, Poisson's equation. So Laplace's equation, uh, if you force Laplace's equation, then you get Poisson's equation. It sounds super cool. Uh, it's a little fishy if you ask me. This just says that you have Laplace's equation, uh, del squared phi, but instead of equaling zero, this equals some forcing f. So where f is uh, a forcing function. And this forcing function could be um, a function of space, a function of time. Uh, it could be that I'm, you know, that's my blowtorch on my, my uh, thermal plate, on my metal plate. This could be the, the forcing function that I'm, I'm hitting it with a blowtorch. Now what's the steady state distribution? So this is just a source term. Um, and it turns out that Poisson's equation and Laplace's equation are computationally used all the time. When you want to solve a fluid flow equation, the Navier-Stokes equation, it's much more complicated than just Laplace or just uh, Poisson or just the wave equation. It's a nonlinear partial differential equation that has some diffusion and some nonlinear convection and things like that. But often how we solve it, there is a step where we solve Poisson's equation. Um, so we like lump everything you know, into this f function and we try to solve for this phi using, using Poisson's equation. This is often one of the most expensive steps in solving fluid flow equations on a computer, the Navier-Stokes equations. And so it's interesting that there's actually a lot of effort trying to build new machine learning algorithms and new computational algorithms in general to speed up the, sol the solution of Poisson's equation. So it seems like it's kind of a simple, uh, simple equation here. We know it's linear. We know it has you know, relationship to all of these, these types of physics. So if I force my, my uh, electrostatic system, then I get Poisson's equation. Uh, but it actually is still very, very relevant even for modern uh, high performance computing of nonlinear partial differential equations as well. Okay, PDEs are amazing, powerful, expressive ways of representing physics and conservation laws. And this is just one example of a very special PDE, Laplace's equation, with tons of examples uh, in science and engineering. All right, thank you.